My name's Andy, and I'm from the States. I'm a burger, as you can clearly tell. Um, uh, I got my PhD in communication. I did digital media, and it's a social science degree. And when I started um, researching, the big topic was violence in video games. If you play a violent video game, you see violent content, therefore you learn how to do it, and I thought that was bullshit. And so, uh, because I played a lot of video games, when I played games, I need to slow down, again, for non-native English speakers, but I get excited. When I played games, what I learned was the mechanics. And as builders and game players yourselves, you probably know this. Um, at FCC, they had Tekken 3 up um, to play. That was my jam back in the day. I still remember hitboxes and combos and timing. I couldn't play at, at the conference because I would embarrass myself how good I am at this game. I played way too much. But anyways, um, uh, th the focus there was on mechanics and gameplay as, as, as that's what people are uh, really engaging with in games. So it doesn't matter if there's blood or not. It matters a little bit for very small effects anyways. Uh, but, but, but that's my background. And so when I came into the space, I was a professor. I studied that. I researched. I published on it for uh, a little while. Um, but then I left because uh, Ethereum, like, let's go, right? This is very fun. Um, CryptoKitties was happening, and composability magic just struck me. Say, what can we build with this now? And so I joined the industry. Um, but what I'm really kind of interested in is uh, not just the builder experience and how we build games for players, but as Autonomous Worlds, I'm, I'm really aligned with this idea, is uh, I want to create a platform where any user can make their own quests and mini games. And so uh, what we heard downstream earlier, and a lot of these projects that, that you guys are working on uh, are similarly aligned. But there's, uh, I've refined my talk just like sitting in, this, in my chair, just so you know. So if I go, go off topic, so be it. But something that's um, really interesting when we think about games is there are builders, there's engineers, who get really excited about uh, affordances in the code, commit reveal schemes, and how that affects player experiences. And that's really important and critical. But when you get average users who don't interact with the code, so we're trying to make a no code um, questing system, they don't care at all about that. And there's other things that matter very much uh, to them as to what, what they interact with. And if we're creating autonomous worlds, which are, which are user created experiences in some form, we got to be really conscious about that. So um, I, I wanted to talk about that and have a conversation. Um, uh, I've, we've built Infinity Keys over the past year. The back end, we're now moving into sort of a front end, actually turning the infrastructure into a game and, and making that process. And in doing so, we've done a lot of play testing where we create the games. And as a builder, it's really easy and fun to make hard games. You make hard puzzles because like that's it's really intrinsically rewarding to me to like make these cool linkages together on these puzzle games. Well, that turns out to be a really shitty user experience to just, all right, hey, it's a new crypto game. Let's test it out. And you can't solve anything without help and hints and joining a Discord. And guess what? Most normies aren't in Discord either. I asked, I told my best friend from college, I was like, hey, join Discord, you know, join, join my, uh, uh, our, our server so I can boost my numbers. I need one more, right? And he's like, isn't, isn't Discord for like alt-right, you know, Nazi propaganda? I'm like, no, 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 D dude, it's just games. Like people don't know what these are. And so there's this other level. So there's two levels of UX that I want to talk about um, a little bit about the gameplay itself and that UX and whether they're hard or easy, well-designed games, but then also um, like just the onboarding UX and, and that. And I'll tell a little bit of story about what we've done at Infinity Keys. I think we've done it a little bit backwards, but we are where we are and we're gonna keep on moving forward. Um, so, so just for reference, I'll move slides eventually so you don't have to look at my face twice, but for now, uh, Infinity Keys universal questing platform. Anything can be a task, and a user should be able to select anything as a task. Collect an NFT, um, call an API so you can follow somebody on Twitter, call an API so you have to be some, at some location while it's raining. I think that would be a cool one. Put in a passcode, whatever. Whatever you want to make a task, we've got a bucket for that. And then there's a middle layer of game logic that puts it into a game format that kind of lets you do hints and images and story and text and things like that. And then the final component is a, a treasure 
uh, receptacle. It's a, called the rewardable. It's an, a container that anything can be a treasure, uh, a, a token or a web page or whatever, whatever you want. You can stick in there. And the idea is when we let players start making their own games, tasks in a game sequence and rewards, well, you can make some of those tasks, requirements, other people's games. So you make a game, and now I make that a requirement in my game. And when you start getting a lot of those, you get a really interesting network of worlds and quests that maybe they go into Cometh, and, and we have that with Cometh. And then they go into Avagachi. We've got an Avagachi one, et cetera, et cetera. Or th then you got to do a Steam achievement. So now I got to go play some Steam games or whatever it happens to be. That's the idea, uh, what we're building. We have the back end, like I said. Um, and I'll tell you about next steps later, but I'm not going to show my stuff too much. But, oh, as I say, as I immediately show you. No, this is uh, an experience we made for this conference only. Uh, I don't know if the internet's good, but this is an augmented reality geolocation NFT. It's a free mint. Um, if you're in the north of Paris where we are, you'll get one sculpture, and you mint it, and it's a little piece that mints to the sculpture. Um, and then when you mint, we'll, we'll, you'll get a copy. It's all free mint on, on Ethereum. If you're along the Seine, you get a different one, and if you're in the south, you get a different one. Um, the South is the skull. It's for the catacombs. It's really badass, so we got to go South. Uh, but do it. It's a free mint. It's fun, uh, and we're just playing with geolocation uh, as a test, as a requirement. Um, and this one happens to use Magic Link. Is anybody from Magic Link here? Good. <laughs> oh, oh shit. Well, it's in there somewhere. Sorry. It, it, that just goes to Eventbrite? Yeah. Oh, all right. Never mind. I'll give you the right one in a minute. My bad. I'll fix it. All right, but we'll talk about uh, topic a little bit. Uh, hard games. For hard games, you get few players. Dedicated players, committed players, sometimes wealthy players. If you're making a mobile game, you only need a couple of whales, and you're good, right? That's the model of the industry. And so you can make these hard games. And when we first started Infinity Keys, people, everyone, you know, we kind of tell people what we're, and they're like scavenger hunts. Um, and scavenger hunts were exciting last year. Everybody wanted to make some. What happens with scavenger hunts, do you guys remember the MeBits one? It was popularized. So MeBits did this hidden scavenger hunt, and they, um, it ended up being a great promotion tool, and so everybody wanted to do scavenger hunts after it. But if you actually look at the MeBits scavenger hunt, what happened was uh, one small team solved it. And so you had this engagement in this game, the scavenger hunt game, with basically three people who were very committed, and they solved this really hard problem. And MeBits was big enough that um, they got a bunch of press for it. And so everybody like, wanted that for the press. But when you're actually building games, like games that are too hard, really you're only engaging with a couple of people. And most of us building games, I need more than a couple of people to play my game. I need some significant amount. So then you go the other way. And you say, OK, we're going to make easy games. And you get a lot of players, but they play very quickly. The more you reduce the barrier to entry, the more you know, they come in, they play, and they bail. Or in this market in crypto, you get the bot farms that are kicking up against you and, you know, farming whatever it is you're going to sell. So there's this dichotomy, fast games versus uh, easy games versus hard games. Of course, we're all looking for perfect games. Are you guys familiar with flow, flow model of play? So flow is this really hyper-engaging state. It's what you played when you played when you were a kid and you just, like, lost track of time, super rewarding. That's a flow state. Um, it happens in, in work tasks, too. And flow occurs. This is a psychological phenomenon. It's re really cool and, and well studied. Uh, when the tasks are at, at, at the correct um, ratio to the skill of the player. So um, it, easy games for players with very low skill, those can be really, really engaging. I'm really good at Tekken. And so if I play you guys at, at Tekken, I don't know if anybody else is good at me, but like seriously, I'm good. It's not exciting to me because I'm just like murdering people. It's not that fun. Um, I, I used to play uh, Mario Kart with my kids, and it's just not fun. Like, I just dust them. They're good now. They beat me. My kids legit beat me at video games. It's an exciting day for me, but now it's getting a little too hard because they have time and I don't. We're all looking for this perfect game, that Goldilocks moment of flow, but it's so hard to achieve. That's why the model of the gaming industry is you QA the heck out of your game, and then you, you wait for those perfect moments. And that's why it's so expensive to make those AAA games, one of the many reasons it, it's very expensive. Hard to do when we're testing prod and trying to build and ship. I, you make so many games. Like, it's just constant. It's hard to find that, those perfect things. Uh, but that's what we're aiming for. Uh, something to keep in mind, gamers are lazy. And so building, especially in Web3, web 
We got to make sure that the game is the right difficulty, but the experience of getting to the game, the UX, is not the challenge. So that's something we faced early on is connecting a wallet, you know, where do you mint, you've got to do gas on this chain, this and that and the other. All of that experience, that's not the game. And many people are not willing to play that. We are, we're a bunch of nerds at a blockchain conference, we're still early, but most people are not willing to play that and would rather just, okay, you guys figure it out, once it's fun to play, uh, uh, let me know and I'll come back. So people are lazy, they want a smooth experience, then they want a rewarding experience at the end that matches their level of uh, skill. Um, so just some uh, things to keep in mind here. This UX versus challenge. I, I think that UX right now is still responsible for most Web3 gaming challenges, um, but that's an arbitrary challenge. That means that you've been in Web3 for a while, you already know which wallet you're using. If you know the difference between MetaMask and Rabi and you know which one is on which browser, you're in a, a very different class of player than most of the players that are gonna interact with our games. And so we've gotta solve that in, um, in some creative ways. Uh, anyways, uh, so uh, account abstraction, we've all been talking about this for a while. We've got, th this is what we've done on a, at Infinity Keys and it creates some limitations. But when you go to log in, we gotta log in that uses account abstraction wallet. It's Keep, K-E-Y-P, they're a partner of ours. You can log in with your Discord, we assign you a wallet in the background. You don't even know you have it, but that's what creates your profile. You can link up your MetaMask or your, whatever your aux is as well in uh, profile. Um, but really, you've got this background wallet. So then, instead of w when you go to claim a reward, it's a, we mint you an NFT. Uh, instead of you paying for gas, we've just decided you click the button and you get it. We're just going to mint it to this wallet that you've got. And now it's an achievement. It's sitting there. Right now you can't move it, like it's just a game piece. It's not very on-chain, self-custody, you know, own your own, self-sovereignty, own your own assets, we know. Um, but we're trying to find out the balance of making sure the challenge is not the UX. Um, we have uh, partnered with a number of, of projects, Cometh is one of them, uh, um, and Avogachi is the other. For Avogachi, we did this onboarding quest, because do you guys know Avogachi? So it's a uh, it's, it's great little game, amazing community, it's not a little game, it's a big old game. Um, but getting started with Avogachi, you have to have a gachi. And it's like 300 ghost, which fluctuates, but it's basically like 300 bucks, depending on, on prices. So that's a pretty high barrier to entry. And so we said, okay, we'll make it really easy. We'll let people come in, solve a really basic, easy riddle, and then you're whitelisted to, to rent a gachi for basically no fees, just dust. And then you can experience the game for an hour. Just go rent this gachi. The process of getting on a whitelist and getting the gachi and getting in the game is still this UX challenge. And so even though we're trying to make it smooth for people, we still face these things. These are things we gotta kinda work out still a little bit, uh, what we're doing. Um, so the way that I, we are thinking about games is to really isolate them as, he, here's a separate class of games instead of the tasks you knew, need to get uh, involved. I spoke on this earlier at FCC but what are some gameplay elements that we can do in our games, in our onboarding, maybe e not even as games, but as DeFi protocols or L2s or whatever it happens to be. Um, and so uh, as game developers, you guys are familiar with these, but I wanna suggest that we start th using these to do the tasks in the games because these are familiar mechanics to people that they know very well. Uh, fish is one of my favorite ones, is you have some bait you're gonna throw somewhere and you can upgrade your bait to get a better reward and when you pull something back, you know, some, some of the games do it with physical timing, or you just gotta wait and get luck, there's a randomizer. But if you can adjust your randomizer, your modifier with your bait, now that's a skill-based challenge, because I can think about my bait, I can see what I have as a player. That's an engaging activity um, that is gameplay-based. Fishing is a really interesting mechanic. It doesn't have to be fishing either, right? It could be anything um, uh, as what, you know, you put whatever wrapper you want on it. Uh, combine is another really fun one uh, that I'm sure you've played, right? It, that's all the, any gun modification. You find three new items, you combine them, and then you get an upgrade, which lets you do, do whatever, whatever. But those collect three different items. Things that are based on collect, if we think about the last cycle and what really popped, NFTs pop, they got really exciting because it's just a collecting game. I'm just gonna get this thing, the end, I bought it. That was the challenge. And that's kind of the mass adoption level players that I think we're actually dealing with is people who just want to get something. 
it, there are players who want to like get involved in the game mechanics and do Dark Forest and set up their automation bots and do all of these things and min-max, but that's a smaller proportion of players than most players who are going to engage with, with the games. So if we start thinking about collect this stuff, uh, did you all play WoW or EverQuest in the early days? Collect 10 candles. That's the first quest. Because those are basic. Those are easy tasks that it, it's not that it's a game that I am, get really excited about, but what most players actually get excited about is feeling good about themselves. Not about you know, uh, uh, overcoming some massive skill or problem. But they said, okay, you set me a challenge and I overcame it. I beat you, developer. Yeah, you collected 10 candles, good, right? I want them to beat me. I want that, we want them to feel that way, that they're ov overcoming the tasks that we set for them. Um, story is another really interesting one um, that is, uh, I, I don't think it's explored in Web3 Gaming much at all, but um, there's some ending to a story and you need to get there. So the task can be really easy. I collect an item to advance the story. Um, and that mechanic alone helps people, that, that's a game that people want to play. That tends to be about just right, depending on how hard it is to collect that item. Um, like I, I don't know if I <laughs> said this at the beginning, but I thought this was a 10-minute uh, presentation, so I didn't present that much. Um, <laughs>